Holy One of Israel, our Father, I pray that right now in this moment that you would remind us that you are holy. And we're not to treat you flippantly. You are not common. And so, Lord, I pray that we would demonstrate you the reverence, toward you the reverence that you deserve, that your word deserves. That we would be reminded today that the Holy Spirit is a precious dove who could be offended at any moment. And so, Lord, help us to take our thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. Lord, we thank you for the gift of your Son and his death on the cross for our behalf, for our sin, and for the comforter of the Holy Spirit. And now I pray, Holy Father, for your work of grace to be done in this congregation today. I pray that there would be no pride, arrogance, self-righteousness, but I pray there would be a spirit of humility. I pray that we have not come here to hear a sermon, but to meet God, to know you. I ask these things in Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to invite you this morning to open your Bibles to Galatians. We are starting a new study today, a new series. entitled. The series is entitled Live Free. Live Free. And uh, that will become more clear as we work our way through this awesome epistle of Paul to the church of Galatia. The subtitle for this morning's message is Grace Plus Nothing. Or as the Protestant reformers will say, sola gratia, grace alone. Salvation is grace plus nothing. Salvation is by grace alone. And that truly is, if you will, the melodic line of this book. Now, what is a melodic line? You, some of you know what a melodic line is. If you are involved in music in any way, you know that the melodic line is the repeated note. It's the main emphasis that carries the tune. Well, in the book of Galatians, the note that carries the tune, the main, the main beat, if you will, of this book is that salvation is by grace through faith alone in the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning we're going to be looking at chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and so let's read there together, and this is what we read. Paul writes, Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all brothers who are with me, to the churches of Galatia. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to him be the glory forever amen I wrote a little introduction in your bulletin concerning this book and one of the things that I said is that the book of Galatians is is dynamite it's an explosion of the gospel is what it is you know a lot of times when we think about the gospel we we usually think the gospel is just for the non-christian In other words, if someone's not saved, they need to hear the gospel. The gospel is for them, and that's true. People who are not saved, people who are not converted, need to hear the gospel. They need to be called to come and know God personally, to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, trusting what Christ did for them upon the cross. But here's something that we need to understand, is that the gospel is not just for the non-Christian. 
The gospel is for the Christian. If you are saved, as I am, listen, the gospel is still for you. It's not only the way into the kingdom, it's the way you live the kingdom. Did you hear that? The gospel is not only the way into the kingdom, the gospel is the way you live the kingdom. And so we're going to be talking more about that today. And so really the gospel message is a gospel message of grace, is it not? Salvation is a free gift offered to us by God through Christ, wrought in us by the person of the Holy Spirit. As I heard someone say a few days ago, that true salvation, the gospel message, comes with no strings attached. You can't work for it, you can't earn it. You can't be righteous enough. Obeying the Ten Commandments is not going to earn favor with God. Trying to be a good person will not earn you favor with God. Why? Because at the end of the day, God is holy and we are sinful. That's why we need the gospel. The finished work of Christ upon the cross. For without Christ, death, burial, and resurrection, there would be no hope of our salvation. Listen clearly. But if it were not for the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, then we would not be able to live the kingdom life here and now after salvation. So I ask you, dear Christian, I ask you, dear Christian, what are you doing with the gospel? What type of influence does the gospel have in your life today? Have you thought much about the gospel? Some of you would say, yes, Pastor. Because you talk about it a lot. Well, my job here on Sunday mornings is to keep reminding us of the gospel. But it's your job to live your life every single day in light of the gospel. Okay? So have you been thinking about that? Husbands, do you treat your wives the way they ought to be treated in light of the gospel? Wives, are you seeking to be a helpmate to your husband? But in light of the gospel? Children, are you seeking to obey your parents in light of the gospel? Parents, are you seeking to raise your children in a way to fear the Lord and to trust in Christ alone for salvation and to show reverence for the Holy Spirit and to trust God's word? Because in light of the gospel, what about your giving? Do you give generously, whether it be of your times, your talents, or your finances? Do you give of yourself in light of the gospel. What about the things you think about? The meditation of your mind and your heart. Do you watch things on television in light of the gospel as if Jesus were there with you? Do you listen to things in light of the gospel as if Jesus Christ were there with you? You see, this is how we're to be living our lives. In light of the gospel. We're to be living grace-centered lives. Now, why is that so important? Because many of the believers that Paul is writing to have drifted away from that. I mean, here's the deal. These believers came to a point in their life where they became awfully aware of the holiness of God, the vileness of sin, the love of God. And as a result, they surrendered their lives to Christ as their Lord and Savior. They came forward with a desire, listen, to know God. These believers, they realized that salvation was not by works. They realized that they could not be good enough to earn favor with God. And so, therefore, they abandoned all their self-righteous activities. They abandoned their trust in the law. They abandoned the trust that they had in ritual, religious Judaism. And there was a point in time in their life where they came and they said, we are trusting by faith alone in Christ alone for our salvation. But something's happened. Something's happened. Paul is writing this to remind them Not to drift away from the gospel. Why? Because they are. And why are they drifting? 
because they have allowed themselves to listen to false teaching. You see, false teachers had crept into the church. Listen, Paul founded this church. Paul planted this church during his missionary journey. And after Paul would plant a church, he would schedule visits where he would come back by and see how the church is doing. And he has received word that this church is falling away from the gospel. What about you as an individual? Are you falling away from the gospel? The gospel that has saved you, the gospel that has set you free? Are you allowing yourself to drift away from the gospel? Are you trampling underfoot the blood of Christ? Are you grieving the Holy Spirit of God? Has His Spirit been quenched in your life because of the disrespect that you're showing for the Word of God? Whether it be through an ungodly attitude that you have towards somebody else? Let me ask you a question. Has the root of bitterness sunk deep into your heart? Has the the root of greed, jealousy, pride, self-righteousness? You say, no, pastor, I've been been pretty clean. I've been faithful to confess my sin and repent of my sin, and I allow the Lord to search me daily. I allow the Lord to search me daily and to show me all my hidden faults so that I can faithfully repent because I want to know God and I want to be close to Him. Well, let me ask you this. Are you trusting in your prayer life? Are you trusting in your prayer life to earn God's love? Do you feel like God loves you more when you pray more? Do you feel like God loves you more when you go to church more? Do you feel like God loves you more when you read your Bible more? Then listen, you may not be able to identify a blatant sin in your life, but if, you're, but if, if, you, if you say yes to those things I just described, then you are drifting away from the gospel and you are trusting in your own righteous activity to be pleasing before God listen your righteous acts could not make you right with God your righteous acts before salvation did not cause God to love you God simply loved you. He simply loves you. Loves me while we were in sin. While we were enemies of the cross. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believes in Him will not perish but have everlasting life. But God demonstrated His own love for us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You did nothing to initiate the love of God. You did nothing to deserve the love of God, the grace of God, the mercy of God. God saved you by grace. It's an act of His own volition. It's an act of His will. So listen, dear Christian, now that you are saved... God cannot love you any more than He already loves you. And God does not love you any less 
God does not love you more if you read your Bible more, if you pray more, if you go to church more. Now that honors the Lord. If it's done in the right spirit, it'll help you grow spiritually. I believe it is a proper response to the gospel. But there's nothing that you can do to earn God's love and there's nothing that you can do to lose God's love. There's nothing that you could do to earn God's grace and there's nothing that you can do to lose God's grace. As a matter of fact, dear Christian, you did not do anything to satisfy God's wrath. God satisfied His own wrath. God satisfied his own wrath. When he and the Son and the Spirit all agreed that salvation would be through crucifixion. And God willingly gave his Son and Jesus Christ willingly came and died. And the Holy Spirit was there to empower. And so... We can't work for salvation, and we don't work to keep our salvation. We're saved by the gospel, and we're to live our lives in light of the gospel. Do you, one of the things that God has just made me aware of, and it's just been a burden for me here recently, do you realize how arrogant it is to think that you can, that you can work hard enough to be, to, to earn your salvation, to earn God's forgiveness? Do you realize how arrogant that is? And there's people that teach that today. Again, we get back to our passage and that's what they were doing. They had drifted away from the gospel and these false teachers were telling them, listen, if you're going to stay saved, if you allow me to use those type of slang words, listen, if you're going to stay saved, then you've got to participate in the rituals of Judaism. So these false teachers were creeping into the church and they were telling these believers who had embraced the gospel that salvation truly was not by grace through faith alone, but they had to come to Christ through ritual, religious Judaism. And as a matter of fact, the false teachers were downplaying Paul's apostolic authority. They were saying Paul's really not even an apostle. Don't listen to Paul. Paul does not know what he is talking about. With that in mind, now we come back to verse 1 and we see what Paul's doing. Paul says, look, Paul, that's my name, but let's get something straight. An apostle. Why does Paul say this? Is he boasting in himself? Is he bragging about this call on his life? Absolutely not. Paul is the one who teaches us that salvation is by grace through faith alone. And Paul is the very one who says, if I'm going to boast in anything, I'm going to boast in my weakness. I'm going to boast in the Lord and what He has done in my life. So Paul's not boasting nor is he bragging. But he wants his readers to know that he writes this letter with all the authority of heaven. That the blessed Trinity God Himself has placed His stamp of approval upon Paul's message. So Paul says, Paul, and listen, an apostle. Now look at what he says. Remember, he's confronting these false teachers. Not from men. I'm not an apostle because some man made me an apostle. Nor is it through men. I'm not an apostle because the church said I would be an apostle. He says, I'm an apostle, but it's not from men, and it's not through man. But listen, but it's through Jesus Christ and God the Father. I have this anointing upon my life. I have this call upon my life. And I have the authority to preach this message message, and write this letter because I am an apostle of the Lord God of heaven. He totally refutes just in that single verse. He totally refutes the sarcasm and the lies of the false teachers. Paul's not an apostle. He's man called. He's not God called. He made himself an apostle. God didn't. Paul says, no, no, no. It's the other way around. 
the false teachers who were proclaiming this false message, they were false. They are the ones who did not have the true calling of God upon their life. And here's what breaks my heart. Are you ready? Just how easy Christians are deceived. Paul planted the church. The people heard the true gospel through Paul himself. They responded to the true gospel. And now they're allowing themselves. They're listening to false teachers. And they're drifting away from the message of grace. Going back into legalism. Trusting in their good works instead of trusting in the sovereignty of God. How easy it is for Christians to be deceived. Especially more so in our day. Do you understand that some of the best booksellers in America, Christian booksellers, and some of the largest churches in America are actually false preachers? False. But Christianity as a whole is buying their books, supporting their ministries. I'm talking about good Christian People who have allowed themselves to be deceived and every time they buy a book or purchase a message or whatever it may be, they support financially the ministry of a false teacher. That's why the only way, dear church, the only way, beloved, to truly guard yourself against deception is for you yourself to have a desire in your heart to know God. I truly believe at the moment of our salvation, listen to me, I truly believe, and by the way, you heard me say last week, that's truly what salvation is. Salvation, the essence of Christianity is a call to know God. When we extend the gospel call, we are calling people to know God. Don't you want to come and know God? Don't you want to come and know this holy, awesome God? Who is so holy and so righteous that his wrath was poured out against sin. He could not look look sin over. Sin must be punished. But how could God hate the sin and love the sinner at the same time? How could he condemn sin and save people? I will send my perfect son as a substitute to die in their place. And we go to the Garden of Gethsemane and we see Jesus there grieving at the garden. Listen, we see Jesus grieving. The Bible says that he was crying out that there's any other way. And and, and then he was sweating like drops of blood, whether it was literal or whether it was like. I, I wasn't there. But the Bible says that he was pleading out to God in extreme distress and agony. And we look at that and we think God is up in heaven as a wrathful, vengeful God. And we look down at Jesus and we say, oh, Jesus is so loving and so merciful though. God is wrath and vengeful. Jesus is loving and merciful. But what we don't realize is that Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane is reflecting the heart of a holy God. Don't you want to know Him? Don't you want to know Him? So many sit there in their arrogance and their pride and they refuse to come to Christ and surrender their lives to Him. They want to trust in their good works. It was David Brainerd. David Brainerd was a, was a missionary to the American Indians in the 1700s. And, and before David Brainerd's salvation, listen, before his salvation, he was reared up in a Christian home. And listen, before he was even saved, he would pray and fast for hours. If you want to have your life changed, I want to t- I'll encourage you to read a dangerous book. The Life and Diary of David Brainerd. It's a dangerous book. Why is it dangerous? Because you can't read it and be different. I mean, be the same. You can't read it and keep living like you're living. 
I'm on my third time reading it. The Life and Diary of David Brainerd. And Brainerd talks about how he would go in the snow. Snow would be up to his waist. And he would just begin to weep and call and and pray and call out to God. And he would be there for so long that eventually the snow would melt around him because of the heat of his body and the fervency of his prayer. And, And he looked back on his life and he realized that every time he would pray, every time he would fast, every time that he would call out to God, every time he said he would rise up with a greater awareness awareness of his wickedness and his evil nature and so he would try harder I'll pray more I'll fast more I'll read more I'll study more and every time he would try to do more every time he looked at his his own depravity it was as if the mouth of Hell was opening up and preparing to suck him in. Because no matter how hard he tried, he realized that nothing was good enough. And no matter how hard he tried, he realized that God was too holy and that his righteousness was too filthy. Until one day, he was walking through the woods. And the presence of God fell upon him. And for the first time, he realized that I have been worshiping my works. I have been worshiping my service. I have been trusting in what I could do instead of serving God and worshiping God and trusting in what He has done. And at that moment, He was radically converted. Guess what? He kept praying. He kept fasting. Oh, the burden did not leave him. He had such a melancholy spirit. And he would be in constant brokenness. But listen, the difference was this. He was no longer praying and fasting and all those things to earn the love of God. Now he was praying and fasting because he had the love of God. And because of that, he wanted to know God. Where are you? Have you been truly converted? Are you one of those who says, are you trusting in what you can do? Or have you truly come to that place in your life and says, you know what? I just want to know him. And I believe at the moment of your conversion, listen, this is what I was going to say. At the moment of your conversion, listen, God puts within the heart of every Christian a desire to know him. Listen, God puts a desire within the heart of every Christian to chase after him. Salvation is a work of the Spirit of God. And if the work of the Spirit has been accomplished in your life, then there will be evidence of the Spirit in your life. And the evidence of the Spirit of God in a true Christian's life is that they hunger and thirst for righteousness. But what happens sometimes? Sometimes even after we're saved, what do we begin to do? We begin to drift away from the gospel. We begin to drift away from grace and we begin to get back into works and we begin to get back into law because boy, do we, we like thinking that we can do things. We like thinking that we can control things. And perhaps that's where some of you are right now. You know you're saved, but man, your desire to know God, to chase after God is so weak right now. I mean, your gas gauge is like on empty. It's because you filled your life with so many other things. What did the church at Laodicea say? We're wealthy, we're rich, we have need of nothing. And the Lord says, you don't even know that you're miserable and poor. Are you willing to forsake everything in your life? Christian, have you come to that point in time in your life where you have just knelt on your face before God and said, God, I give you my life, I give you my wife, I give you my kids, I give you my church, I give everything to you. And God, I don't know what all that means, but what I do know is that you are good and I trust you with it. I just want to know you. I just want to know you. I want to spend the rest of my life Knowing you and living for you and bringing glory to you. And that's what it looks like to live a gospel-centered life. Not to earn God's love or try to appease God, but to realize that Christ has already done that before us. And this is not a license to sin. That's the thought of a pagan. 
Are you saying, preacher, that we can just live like we want since salvation is by grace through faith and since grace saves us and grace keeps us that we can live like we want? Listen, dear person, dearly beloved, anybody who believes that has not the Spirit of God in them. They are not saved. They have never been converted. Paul tells us, by no means... But make no mistake about it, those who are genuinely saved have a desire to pursue holiness. Listen, friends. I spent much of the night last night in prayer. Laying on my face. My wife called it my prayer nest. Just made a nest in the floor. Just laid on my face before God. And I started by just saying, God, search me. And I begin to see the depths of my sin. God began to bring to my mind every wicked thought. Every slanderous comment. Every aspect of jealousy and bitterness. And in that moment, your pastor... Just like Brainerd, I understand what he meant. In that moment, I became so aware of just how sinful I truly was. I felt like the gaping mouth of hell was waiting to suck me in. But then I realized that it can't. Because I'm held by the hand of the Almighty King. I'm held in the hands of God by grace. How could I not want to live holy? How could I not want to give all that I am to Him? How could I not want to make significant lifestyle changes? I told Kelly the other day, I just want us to be simple. I want us to be a simple family, just simple. Simple. And we're still trying to figure out what all that means for us, but we just want to be, we just want to be simple. And we just want to live for God. These believers had drifted away from that. Paul says to them in verse 3, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace. And these are Paul's common introductions. He says, Grace. What is grace? It's the unmerited favor of God. Grace is simply what we've been talking about. It's grace is giving you something you don't deserve. I don't deserve to be held by God. I don't deserve to be to be forgiven. I definitely don't deserve to be a joint heir with Jesus. I don't deserve to be redeemed, sealed by the Holy Spirit. God would be perfectly just if he placed me with the damned. God would be perfectly just if he damned Blake Gideon to hell for the rest of his life, for all of eternity. Because that's what I deserve. But God has given me grace. I deserve wrath, but he gave me what I didn't deserve. Instead of wrath, he gave me forgiveness. Redemption. Made me a joint heir with Jesus. Sealed me with the Holy Spirit. He says peace. Peace is also something that we don't have before salvation. Peace with God or the peace of God. As a matter of fact, we're enemies. And Paul says, grace and peace to you. But notice what he says. Now he's going to begin to articulate for us very carefully how the, the, he's going to, several things. He's going to tell us, first of all, the channel of grace. The channel of grace. Look at what he says. Grace to you and peace from, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
Jesus Christ is the channel of grace. Grace is found in no one else but Jesus. Listen to me. Grace is not found in keeping the the sacraments. Grace is not found through confirmation. Grace is not found through religious ritual or the keeping of days. Grace is found in Jesus Christ alone. And every person on the face of this planet is in need of grace. Second thing that we see is the cost of grace. Grace is not cheap. And it's about time that we stop treating it as as if it is. Look at the cost of grace. The Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins. What's the cost? The very fact that Jesus gave himself. What does that mean? It's the crucifixion. The cost of grace was God's, God the Father's very own Son. And the cost of grace was the life of Jesus Christ. And you think about what Christ went through. We're not going to go through all the details right now, but there is a time for that. But you think about the crucifixion itself. The cost of grace may be a free gift to us, and indeed it is, it's a free gift. But listen, it's not cheap. It costs Jesus his life. And when we say to people, when we say to people, hey, come to Jesus, receive Christ by faith, let's baptize you, and it's okay, Now, we don't say it, but we do it by practice. Just go live like you want. Is that not, as a whole, American Christianity? (laughs) The facts prove it, folks. You can't argue with it. Look at our church. What, 4,000 members? And how many do we typically have? Of those 4,000, all of them say what? Oh, I'm a Christian. But how many of them are living pagan lives? You see, you, holiness is not a requirement for salvation. But holiness is definitely the fruit of salvation. And we do more danger than good when we try to soothe someone who is living contrary to God. I talked to a preacher the other day and he and I were talking about this and I said, what happens? I said, there's not much preaching on the holiness of God today or the sinfulness of sin. I said, or if we do, what happens? As soon as we mention holiness, wrath, or hell, we begin to sense that people get uncomfortable. And because we don't want people to be uncomfortable in our service because that may make us look like a bad preacher, right? And we want to be liked. So as soon as we sense that they're getting uncomfortable, what do we do? We immediately run to something that makes them comfortable. Let's get past the holiness of God. Let's get past the wrath of God. Let's get past, let's get past hell. And let's hurry up and run to the love of God and talk about heaven. We have got to, give, we have got to allow the Holy Spirit time to allow the depth of conviction to settle. Jesus gave himself. And what does grace demand? Grace demands that we live our lives for him. I'm not just talking about Christian pastime. I'm talking about living your lives for him, to know him. What is the purpose of grace? To deliver us. Look at what he says. Gave himself for our sins to what? To deliver us. 
Here's the truth. Every person born in this world is on the wide road that leads to hell because we've all sinned. And God's too holy to allow our sin into heaven or to look it over or to pass it by or to wink at it. Listen, God does not blush at sin. God hates it. God does not blush at sin and cover his head. Oh, that's bad. Or do like we do. Oh, that's a bad thing on TV. Oh, let me hurry up and switch the channel right quick and we'll come back to it in a minute. Oh, that's bad on TV. I shouldn't be watching that. Let me, let me hit mute and put the info screen up so you can't see what's happening. Because we, we blush, don't we, sometimes. Some of us don't even blush anymore. God, help us. But we, we blush. And so, you know what God does? God doesn't blush. God doesn't cover his eyes. God looks at it intensely. And he pours out his righteous indignation, his holy, consuming Wrath! And that is what every person is under who is not truly converted. They are under the wrath of God. You say, Pastor, that's just the pedophiles and the rapists and the murderers. No! Jesus tells us who it is. At the end of the chapter, Jesus says, It's every person who says to me, Lord, Lord, didn't we do this? In other words, didn't we do all these religious activities in your name? Yes! The vileness of all who sin. Yes, every person who has not trusted in Christ, every person, every atheist, every agnostic, every person who is every person who worships another religion, every person who denies Christ and his sufficiency upon the cross, every person will spend an eternity in hell unless they're saved. But listen, it's not just them, it's those who by all rights appear to be religious, but they are nothing more than hypocrites. But he has delivered us. If you indeed are saved, you've been delivered. You're no longer on the wide road that leads to destruction. With the dark cloud of God's righteous indignation hovering upon it. No, you've been placed on the narrow road which leads to life. It's not an easy road. It's hard, I know. And it's a blood-sprinkled path, as Coach would say. But it's the road of forgiveness. and It's the road of redemption. It's the road of grace. And we are on that road. Not because of anything that we have done. But what Christ has done for us. How should we respond to such grace? To keep living for ourselves? To wave at God every now and then? To come church and pat ourselves on the back? Or should we not spend the rest of our lives knowing Him? You know why I married my wife? You know why I married her? Because I thought she cooked good? Cleaned house well? You know why I married her? 
because I wanted to know her. And I want to spend the rest of my life knowing her. And that is just a glimpse of what our relationship is to be to God. You know why I come to God? Because He forgives my sin. He cleans up my life. Because I want to know Him. And I want to spend the rest of my life knowing Him. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and He has transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son. Lastly, what is the source of grace? Look there at the last part. To deliver us from this present evil age according to what? The will of our God. We're saved by grace through faith in Christ. We are delivered. We are delivered from darkness and from destruction and from the wrath of God by the will of God. Period. So what should you spend the rest of your life doing? If you have experienced such grace, you should spend the rest of your life growing in grace. It's what Peter tells us to do. Grow in grace in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Grow in grace and knowledge. How do you grow in grace? By living your life in light of the gospel. I'm not asking you to do more. If you leave here thinking, well, the preacher wants us to do more, then you've missed it. You're still caught up in legalism. I'm not, this is not a do more sermon. This is a sermon to call to know him. For the unbeliever, for the unsaved, and for the Christian. Because the more you know God, the more you'll love God. And the more you love God, the more you'll obey God. And that, my friend, is the picture of the true Christian life. I shouldn't have to tell you how to get to know God, shouldn't I? Pray. Spend time with Him. Spend time with Him. More than you ever have. If you have a desire, if the Lord says to you, if you have this desire in your heart, you know what, I don't think I'm going to sleep tonight. I think I'm just going to stay up all night in prayer. That's probably not a good idea. I mean, that's probably not an idea that you have. That's probably God putting something on your heart. It may be the fact that He's placing that on your heart or to fast or to pray or whatever it may be because He's calling you to know Him more deeply, more intimately. So in conclusion, what do we see in this passage? We see the holiness of God. God is so holy that He could not just let look over sin. He is so holy and so righteous and so good and perfect that sin had to be punished. So we see the holiness of God, but not only that, we see the wrath of God. God is so holy and sin is so vile. It's wicked, it's evil. It doesn't matter if it's a white lie or murder. It's all evil in the sight of God. And so we see the holiness of God. We see the vileness of sin. The fact that Jesus Christ had to come and die, that's how vile sin was. And the fact that he would cry out, if there's any other way, let this cup pass from me, that's how vile sin was. So we see the holiness of God, the vileness of sin, and we see the wrath of God. Poured out upon Christ so that we could be delivered. He delivered us from what? From this present age. He delivered us from darkness. And then what do we see? We see the love of God. And the very fact that God satisfied his own wrath by sending his own son to die in your place. Don't you want to know him? We're going to bow our heads in prayer now and I'm going to ask for our musicians to come. And 
There's some of you here this morning and you've never truly come to the Lord and said, Lord, I just want to know you. So the first call this morning is a call for salvation. Are you lost in sin? Are you trusting? Have you been trusting in your own religious activity? Then perhaps you would come this morning and simply say, Lord, I want to know you. I want to know you. We'll have pastors standing down front. Just come to them and let us pray with you. Others of you, you know you're saved. But you've been allowing yourself to drift away from the gospel, away from a grace-centered life. You've wanted, you've turned your, you've turned Christianity into a to-do list. And you check off your to-do list. That's legalism. But God has convicted you this morning and perhaps you just want to kneel at this altar and say, Oh God, thank you for reminding me that Christianity itself is just about knowing you. Some of you have got so much junk in your life right now that you're trying to fix and it's never going to get fixed until you just say, Lord, I can't do it. I just want to know you. I just want to know you. I'm not asking you to leave here to do anything. I'm just asking you to say, Lord, I want to know you. Heavenly Father, we commit this time to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and begin to come now as the Lord leads?